All right, guys, welcome to Punic War Part 1! A new boat. This is an overview with all of the major engagements in the Punic War. Now, I'm not asking you to memorize this, that's nuts. Rather, this is to give you an idea of the scope of this war and the overall plot arc. So you'll notice this starts around 288. There's some shenanigans going into 288 and 271. Hostilities begin around 264, and then hostilities don't cease until 241. So we're talking about almost 30 years worth of war, plus some change if you count the initial hostilities. So this is quite a lengthy one, and that's part of what's working in Rome's favor. It's long, it's drawn out, and Carthage gets a little bit tired. So the highlights, first the things that are in your reading. You're going to be reading Polybius's account of the Siege of Agrigentum and the Roman victory at Mylae. We're talking about Agrigentum because it's an instance of Rome's use of topography to counter and head off any possibility of uh, naval bailout on the Carthaginian side, and also there's some um, clever sabotaging of the food supply that goes on. So it's just a, it's a neat engagement, and it's short-ish. My lie we're reading about because it's a moment where Rome manages to make a technological innovation that wins them a naval battle against the freaking Carthaginians. So this is a happy day for Rome. Then I think I've also got you reading, no, that's not in this one. So all I'm having you read for this version of this class is the battle account of Agrigentum and Mylae. The parts of this outline that are in red are the bits where Rome is doing well the bit in the blue is when Carthage is doing well, and you will notice that there's a bit of a repeated theme here. Uh, Rome has to build a fleet at the beginning of this conflict. Now, we used to think that Rome built an entire fleet for this conflict. That's not quite the case. Rome certainly had merchant vessels, and likely the city-state of Rome had some military vessels too, but they didn't have enough to go up against Carthage, we think. So Rome has to very quickly upgrade its navy. The way they do this is they capture a Carthaginian ship in good enough condition that they can pull it apart, kind of make a diagram, and then they go and reproduce it. So uh, likely this is not the first time Romans have ever built a ship. That's an exaggeration. We're 90% sure. But what they do do is they copy the best that Carthaginian shipbuilders can accomplish and make their best guess at how that works. And then they try to use their strengths to offset their newness to naval warfare. More about that in a bit. So this Immediate cause for war happens when a group of mercenaries called the Mamertines, these aren't Romans, they're from an area near Rome, they occupy Masana when they're engaged in um, a battle in the island of Sicily, and they apply to Carthage and Rome for help in holding that city. Carthage and Rome both respond. Uh, but on different sides of the conflict, and this draws them into war with each other. That's the very, very short version. Um, this isn't a political history class. I'm not going to have you spend too much time with that, because we've got to talk about the mechanics of this war. So Rome advances into Sicily, and this works out really well for Rome, because they need to buy time to get their fleet up to snuff, but what they're really good at by this period is land battles. They're military has been expanded and they have access to recruits from places other than the immediate metropolitan area around Rome through various mechanisms. This military is easily moved from Italy to Sicily. It's right there and adjacent. And at this point, Rome begins the slow work of taking Sicily away from Carthage. Carthage 
has possession of some, not all of the island of Sicily at the beginning of this conflict. There's another city-state on the island, that of Syracuse, which is neither Carthaginian nor Roman at this point. It's just on Sicily. So as Rome is making inroads on the island of Sicily, they begin building their fleet. And once they have it, they begin engaging the Carthaginian navy that's trying to sail around Sicily and land to get around the Roman infantry. This works out really well. At the Battle of Mylae, Rome manages to board, capture, and sink quite a number of Carthaginian ships, and it surprises the international community. Uh, folks didn't expect a lot of naval success out of Rome, let alone naval success against Carthage, right? That's, that's kind of embarrassing, Carthage. Uh, however, this was a, a short-lived victory because there was a storm in 265 while Rome was in the process of invading North Africa. So they send a landing party across the sea to the beachhead in, um, at Tunis, where they meant to then proceed into the city of Carthage and invade through the walls except all of the ships that were at anchor waiting for the Romans to get done with that were caught up in a storm that blew out through the Mediterranean. This is not the first time this has happened, but the entire fleet was lost due in part to some top heaviness. But spoilers, we'll get into what was up with that later. So at this point, Carthage manages to get a second wind. They begin to push the Romans back. They take large portions of Sicily again. Hamilcar Barca begins raiding extensively, and it's looking good for Carthage. Uh, meanwhile, Rome builds another fleet, which then sinks again. So they're now like two, two new fleets have sunk. And Carthage is like, in 247, okay, we've won the Battle of Trapana. The Romans are on the back foot but we're losing a lot of money because they've had to pay their mercenaries now for decades. And that's a very, very long time to have people on your payroll. So Carthage begins sending their allies home bit by bit in order to cut costs. And this is not a bad strategic decision. They're assuming that Rome is going to know when quit and Rome is not gonna be able to financially manage to build a third fleet. They had to dig deep for fleet number two. So Rome is even more bankrupt than Carthage at this point. Ah, but Rome is full of surprises, as you'll see in 242. Rome makes fleet number three, 200 quinquiremes, financed in large part by the women of Rome, who sell and don't sell their jewelry and donate it to the public purse. This jewelry is then repurposed to buy the supplies and the craftsmanship to make fleet number three, which Rome then sails to the Agates Islands, surprises the Carthaginian fleet and wins a decisive victory. At this point, Carthage is like, oh God, fine. They make a peace treaty. Uh, in their mind, it's a temporary peace treaty. They agree not to attack Rome. They're gonna pay reparations and really Carthage can afford reparations they've still got all of their trade routes intact. So the Carthaginian plan at this point is, okay, we'll just sit back, we'll pay our war debt, we'll reestablish our trade routes, and we'll just stop fighting the Romans because this is getting ludicrous and we'd like to go back to our lives now. Uh, but Rome sits and stews for the next few decades, uh, which is why there's a Punic War too. But not all Carthaginians are on board with the live and live plan either. Uh, you'll notice I mentioned Hamilcar Barca. He very much disagreed with his government's decision to make a treaty with Rome and declare strategic defeat. And at least according to Roman legend, and we have to be careful about how much credence we give to this story. He raises his two sons to swear eternal vengeance on Rome. And he makes plans and then executes them to start gaining Carthage imperial territory in Spain. Hamilcar Barca is the father of Hasdrubal and his brother Hannibal, like that Hannibal, this is his dad. So, uh, both Rome and Carthage are licking their wounds, biding their time, and getting ready for part two. 
A couple notes about developments and shifts since we last talked about shift design. I mentioned quinquireme's. We saw the trireme back when we were looking at the Peloponnesian War and the Persian Wars. Yeah, so this is the state of the art military vessel for the 5th century BCE. Future developments in ships center on how many wrote or how many levels of benches in your ship and how many oarsmen you can put on an oar. The more people holding an oar, the more pulling power is on that oar, which means the more speed you can get out of your ship or the larger a ship you can make to carry bigger things like elephants because one of the new problems introduced by elephants in warfare is that you have to have ways of transporting elephants across the sea enter giant multi rower or banks the quadrivine is so named for its uh, four people on each side so it's still got three levels very few ships get beyond a three level limit because that makes your ship very tall the taller your ship the more it's likely to capsize we don't want that also the taller it gets the deeper the draft has to be and deep drafts mean limited harbors and this is coastal warfare so you want ships that can get in pretty close to the coast but you can add people to the oars so you get this three level quadrivine but also you can have a quadrivine by putting two people per oar on a two oar bank ship or you can just have four people holding an oar all on one level and that makes a very flat very stable ship with a really wide deck all good ideas but oh we are not done guess what they do next yes more people on the oars <laughs> so we're never getting above three people tall, but what we do get are more and more people per oar on the banks, including 12-person ships, 16-person ships. Sometimes these ships were joined together with decking from one ship to another ship to another ship in a kind of giant catamaran, and this was used to transport multiple elephants comfortably at a slow cruising speed across the Mediterranean. But also, each of these conjoined ships had a ram at the front, and they were arranged in a configuration like this, kind of an arrowhead formation, so that when these conjoined ships all sailed together into, say, a seawall or a sea gate, they would bump one after the other with their rams into the walls, making them into a giant inertia battering ram. The added weight on these massive ships would mean that you were crashing an enormous amount of pressure onto sea gates that have uh, limitations in terms of how sturdily they can be built and how well the mechanisms are going to hold up to banging. So this is a wonderful moment in the world of gigantic ships. It doesn't get much more gigantic than this, though. The, the Ptolemies go in for the super, super big ships, but at a certain point it becomes impractical and hard to fund, and sometimes your money is better spent building a lot of little ships rather than a few mega ships. And sometimes you need an aircraft carrier. Just pick your poison. Okay. Here I'm going to introduce you to one of the most amazing finds in the Mediterranean. I'm so excited about this ship. This is the Marsala Punic warship or the Marsala Galley. Uh, this is ancient Lilibium. Lilibium is the site of naval engagement between Sparta and Rome during the th Third Punic War, which is the time this ship dates to. It's a Third Punic War ship. So for once we have a ship that's from the actual time period and the actual conflict we're studying, which is super awesome. The shipworms apparently missed a spot. This, we think, is a Liburnian style galley. The question mark is there because we know the, the word Liburnian. It shows up in a lot of ancient sources, but much like the trireme, they assume that you know what a Liburnian galley is and don't explain in a lot of detail. So what we think is going on with the Liburnian is that we've got at least two banks of oars, probably with multiple people on them. It's a mid-sized vessel that's made for ramming, and 
it has a shallow-ish draft enough that it can do some limited river access. So here we're looking at a reproduction of the ship itself. I'll give you a moment to, to guess if we're looking at a Roman or a Carthaginian ship. Okay. So here we are looking at the ship itself. Now you'll notice that's not a whole ship. What survives is the bit of the ship that had sunk so deep into the sea floor it couldn't be eaten by this, the shipworms. But we've got the most important part in many ways. Look at this. It's a keel beam. We've got almost all the keel beam, including its curve here as it bends towards the stern. And then as it moves straight here to attach into the ram. We also can see the bow of the decking coming out from the keel. So we have this narrow, deep keel and an elegant curve into this wide bellied hold here at the bottom. And we can also see the uh, mortise and tenon joints holding the planking together. So this is the mortise and tenons we see described in ancient texts. Finally, we have enough of the ship that we can look at it in person. So here you can see the planks joined together with, here's one of the wooden dowels holding the um, interlocking pieces in place. So this is just super awesome. Not just that, but also preserved is part of the interior struts. So this is part of the reinforcement that's holding the hull together. And this is an important part of Phoenician ship design. There was something about the way that they were reinforced along the keel and particularly on the prow where the ram goes that made them able to withstand a lot more punishment in a ramming situation than could other ship designs. So this gives us a clue. Now you may notice, or wonder rather, why it is that I'm saying this is definitely a Carthaginian ship. Um, glad you didn't ask. <laughs> well, one of the planks has writing on it, and it's in Carthaginian. Now, we cannot read Carthaginian, we're not sure what it says, but Romans, generally speaking, don't write in Carthaginian on their boats. So what we're looking at here is probably a Liburnian-style Carthaginian galley. So this is all kinds of special, right? Because Rome destroys Carthage with, with extreme prejudice. Part of our trouble in talking about Carthage is that Rome does a very good job of erasing large portions of Carthage. But we have the most important part of a Carthaginian ship hull. So this is really exciting to me. And I hope it excites you too. I just, I like ships. I think they're really cool. And here it is. Ah, bye, Lily, bye, I'm Galley. So I mentioned that Liburnian galleys show up a lot in literature, and they're also pieces of art that we think are depictions of Liburnians. Now, I'm being cautious again, because these artistic representations aren't labeled, like there's nothing on them that says, behold, the Liburnian galley. Uh, no, what we do have are pieces of art like this one. So this at the top is a wall fresco in Pompeii, and it's a scene from the Battle of Actium. So the Battle of Actium is a couple centuries after the Punic Wars. This is between two Roman factions, one of them led by the future Emperor Augustus and the other by Mark Antony and his Egyptian ally Cleopatra VII of Egypt. And these two ships are bypassing each other. So the red one's ram is going this way, and then we can see the ram of the white one coming this way, and you can see the eyes on the front of it. So this gives us a nice clear view of both a bow and a stern, including that uh, iconic curve sweeping up to the back that we saw on the galley we were just looking at. If you look at the rows of oars, you can see that there are two rows, one on below, one above, and then the width gives you room for at least two men per oar. There's also a three level Liburnian, we think two that would have looked like this with one person on the bottom and then two and two because the people on the top need to have 
more strength to pull the ore than the person on the bottom where the, the fulcrum point is closer. The other thing I want to say about these two Liburnians, you can tell that they are cataphract because there are people standing on the decking. So both of these galleys are full of marines. And the marines, even though these are Roman marines, they're armed like hoplites in that they have spears and round shields. And this is because eventually Romans cottoned on to round shields being much more useful in boarding actions. Um, not that you can't use a scutum, but round shields give you a little bit more freedom of movement. And that's important when you're doing boarding actions. So here's one more depiction here of an earlier Roman warship. So this is closer to the Roman warships of the Punic Wars. This is a coin minted in the first century BCE. Uh, we can date it from the Quaestor. The, the Roman in charge of minting this coin was a dude named Publius Nasidius. And you can see all the features we just saw on the last page, only this galley is under sail because it's not currently at war. So it's got a ram on the front, so that's how we know it's a warship. And this, from the angles of the oar, it seems to perhaps be a three-level galley, uh, but it's not that clear. The details aren't quite there. And then you can see that the sail is reinforced with this webbing overlaid on the linen, and that's important. The, the webbing made the sail um, easier to furl and unfurl, especially if you were um, docking and replacing the mast in combat situations. But it also reinforces it so that if there's a tear, the tear isn't going to pull through the entire sail. So it's a little bit like ripstop nylon only you know, linen. I mentioned that the Romans come up with a very important technological innovation at this period. And here we are, we're at that point. I would like to introduce you guys to the Corvus or Corvus. You'll hear it pronounced both ways. Corvus is classical Latin, so I'm going to go with that. That's the Roman word for a crow, like a crow beak. And the idea was that just like a crow when it's breaking a nut will bonk its beak down onto the nut. The corvus has a tooth at the bottom. You can see it here attached to the underside of a boarding ramp. And all of this is secured to a crane mechanism. Now this crane and the ramp assembly could be lowered parallel with the deck. So you wouldn't put this up unless you were in a combat situation. So once in a combat situation, you would lift the flagpole as it were. So you would lift this mast and you would use a pulley system to hold the ramp up until it's time to board. You would sail your ship up to the enemy ship, uh, ramming them in the process, and then this mast assembly is on top of a set of ball bearings. So this rotates 365 degrees around. And then once you get it aimed at the deck of the ship you're trying to board, you release the mechanism holding that pulley in place. The ramp falls down with gravity and the spike bites into the enemy decking, thus joining you and the enemy ship in a way that's not easy to dislodge. Like if you just put a ladder from your ship to their ship, all they have to do is knock the ladder off. That's a very unreliable way of boarding an enemy ship. But if you lock your ship onto the other person's ship, you've essentially created a land battle on sea. Your Roman Marines, and in this, the first Punic War, it's essentially Roman infantry people on a boat because purpose trained Marines weren't quite a thing for them yet. Give them time. So the Corvus comes down, the Romans board over the ramp, they capture the enemy ship, and boom, Rome gets another ship. And as you can see, they really need all the ships they can get in this conflict. So, pretty nifty innovation, yeah? Really good idea. It gives you a secure-ish way to board enemy ships. You can get lots of uh, heavily armed men over it. The railing keeps them from falling off. You know, all of this is a really good idea. So what you may be asking me is the downside to this idea. Well, take a moment to think about what floating things do on water. Then take a moment to think about what putting 
large ramp assemblies with a pulley and ball bearings on top of the decking does to the weight balance in the ship, especially if you're putting them on the prow of the ship where your ram is. And then imagine what would happen to that ship if, say, a storm blew in from the Mediterranean while you were with your anchors weighed down waiting for your land army to get done fighting um, an invasion of Carthage. This is how you lose two fleets in the same dang war. This is why Rome had to build that third fleet, is the Corvus had a fatal flaw. It's top heavy. And Roman ships had a nasty tendency to capsize and sink in a, even a mild storm. Uh, not just that, but they were pretty easy to tip over to, and the Carthaginians seem to have quickly realized this. So it's not a foolproof idea, but it's not a bad idea either. It just illustrates the cost-benefit trade-off going into figuring out how to board an enemy ship effectively and avoid damaging what could be a valuable prize. On our last slide, this is a helpful diagram made of our best evidence for what a Corvus looked like. This is a coin minted by Gaius Duilius, the leader in charge of the Roman half of the Battle of Mylae. We're reading Mylae because that's the battle in which the Corvus premiered. And this was the moment where Duilius's technological gamble pays off dividends for Rome. This is the artist reconstruction of what's going on in this coin. So here is the deck of the Roman galley. You can see the ram down here. And then on the top, we have the undeployed corvus. So here is the boarding platform undeployed. And then this is the masthead that's used to operate the crane. On the bottom, we, we think these are two marines, although I think this is a bit of a uh, fanciful suggestion. They, they kind of look like two little blips to me, but on we go. Uh, on the top is written Roma, just in case you were confused as to whose ship this was. Actually, that's very nice. Historians appreciate that. And then uh, this is the fulcrum assembly that's used to turn the whole thing. Here is the prow stem of the ship itself, so that's what your boarding ramp or boarding ramp is maneuvering around. But you can see why this might be a liability. It is sitting not just on top of the decking, but very on top of the decking, right? It's poking out higher than if these are Marines standing on the deck, their heads are here, the Corvus is all the way up here. This is like a full Marine's height taller than the people walking around on the deck. That's a good way to tip over. And wouldn't you know, that's what ends up happening. So my final thought for the first Punic War is this. All technical technological innovations come with drawbacks, but knowing when to use them and when to not use them is an important part of any calculation in warfare. The other thing I'd say about the First Punic War is that it's a testament to Rome's bloody-minded determination to keep banging their head against a problem, especially when it involved warfare. And part of their motivation is still coming from this place of perceived vulnerability. Romans were worried about the Gauls, then they were worried about Pyrrhus, and now they're really worried about Carthage, and they are right to be worried. Carthage if they lose a war with Rome, to their mind, it doesn't mean the end of their civilization. They've just lost a war with this large-ish land-based power in Italy. It does nothing for their trade routes on the Atlantic seaboard. It doesn't even threaten their holdings in Spain. They've still got Corsica and Sardinia. Like From Carthage's point of view, Rome is just ir irritating. I mean, very irritating enough to go to war with, but irritating. But from Rome's point of view, if they lose this one, they have the Gauls waiting to come at them from the north, the Greeks coming at them from the east, the Carthaginians and the Numidians coming across the sea. Rome is surrounded by the Carthaginian factions and allies, and they're very well aware that 
in the Mediterranean, you're in a political and military environment where everyone is looking for the next bit of limited real estate to gobble up. Carthage can afford to lose this war. Rome cannot. And they keep trying until they do. So that's the takeaway, guys. If your pack is up against a wall, make sure that you've planned for three fleets and you support the sciences because you're going to need it. Good luck, and I'll see you in Punic War 2.